straight ahead on Law & Crime Daily. The contentious case of Kyle Rittenhouse. We enter day two of Verdict Watch as the jury deliberates in Wisconsin. And I think these people are as competent as the educated people, and many of them are educated, uh, to make these decisions. Meanwhile, supporters and protesters take to Kenosha. I was just so compelled to come and show support for him. We're going to get a serious win here today. We hear from both sides. Plus, defendant Travis McMichael takes the stand in the death of Ahmaud Arbery trial. I want to give my side of the story. I want to explain what happened and to, uh, to be able to say what happened from, from the way I see it. And later, the Tiger King is back. Anybody that's followed this knows that Joe's still in prison and Carol's still not in prison. Law & Crime Daily sits down with the attorney for Joe Exotic, who says his client deserves a new trial. Law & Crime Daily covering court cases from coast to coast. Welcome everyone to Law & Crime Daily. I'm Brian Buckmeyer along with Terry Austin. Jurors asked to see videos of the night Kyle Rittenhouse shot three men, killing two of them as they deliberate. Our Angela Levy joins us now live outside the Kenosha County Courthouse with arguments about the video and some comments from Judge Shader about criticisms he and the attorneys have received. Well, Brian, there were arguments about how these jurors would get to watch these videos and where. And remember that video, it's drone video that we've seen so many times that shows the shooting of Joseph Rosenbaum by Kyle Rittenhouse. The defense actually has requested a mistrial over that piece of video. Now, prosecutors, uh, the prosecution and defense agreed that the current case law requires jurors be brought into the courtroom to watch videos. Prosecutors said jurors should get to watch the video as many times as they like, but the defense felt the jurors should be limited in how many times they could view the video. Judge Schrader felt the jurors should be allowed to watch the video as many times as they feel they needed to, and he felt that restricting the jurors was insulting to them. There was a time when the, the people, educated people in the town were the, the uh, physician and the lawyer and the, maybe the school teacher and the preacher. Um, and the rest of the people were farmers. So obviously they weren't as smart as those educated people, right? Wrong. That's never been the belief of the founders of our country. It's never been true. And I think these people are as competent as the educated people, and many of them are educated, uh, to make these decisions. And that's where the founders of our country put the, uh, the power, not with us. <coughs> So I think it's insulting to the jury to tell them that they have to have these uh, restrictions on their viewing. Now, as I mentioned, the defense requested a mistrial over that piece of drone video that was shot by a citizen and was shown to the jury. Now, Rittenhouse's attorneys claim that they did not receive a high-resolution copy of the video, only a low-quality version. The prosecution says the video shows Rittenhouse provoking the confrontation with Joseph Rosenbaum by raising his gun at him first. Prosecutors say they turned over the video via email and it was compressed in that process unbeknownst to them. The judge cleared the courtroom so the jurors could watch that video on a big screen TV. The state objected to that mistrial request and Judge Schrader has not yet ruled on it. Meanwhile, during all of this, in the middle of these arguments, Judge Schrader talked about some criticism that he and the attorneys in the case have received and he discussed that at length. When I talked about um, problems with the media when this trial started, that's, we were there in part, not, not fully, but in part because of grossly irresponsible handling of what comes out of this trial. I will tell you this, uh, I'm going to think long and hard about uh, live television of a trial again next time. I don't know. I, I, I've always been a firm believer in it because I think the people should be able to see what's going on, but what I see... What's being done is really quite frightening. Frightening, that's the right word for it. And Judge Schrader said he felt that there was a lot of misinformation coming out of the trial and being reported. He also said he was upset by the treatment of the five lawyers in this case. He said that he's worked with all of them on cases in the past. He says that they are all competent and he feels uh, what's being done to them, some of the harassment, is shameful. Brian? 
Thanks, Anjanette. Joining us today is criminal defense attorney Julie Rendleman and Terry Austin. Julie, Judge Schrader has a tendency to digress from the subject, sometimes quoting literature or even the Bible. How do you think the jury is responding to these digressions? Well, I guess it, it really depends on the personality of each of the jurors. Now, keep in mind a lot of his, what some might describe as transgressions and misbehavior and kind of off topic happen when the jury's not there. Um, and so the jury's not necessarily the wiser to it. Um, I, I do always say that if a jury respects the judge, um, A, the case runs smoother, and sometimes if the judge has some inclination or some bias towards one side or the other, then the jury may go along with what they believe the judge's bias is. Um, this is a strange one. The judge, um, you know, is quite quirky. He's gotten a lot of things right. I think he's gotten a lot of things wrong. Um, but again, each juror has their own perception as to what they think of, of what this judge really is like. Makes sense. Terry, there was a discussion on Wednesday about whether the jury would view media inside the courtroom. What are the advantages of having the media in the courtroom? Well, I think there are lots of advantages, Brian, having the media there. First of all, the public gets an opportunity to see what is going on. This is a high profile case, and the public wants to know what's happening. And I think if Judge Shader basically says from now on he's no longer going to allow the media just because he doesn't like the criticisms. And some of the criticisms are well earned. The fact that he said you can't use the word victim, the fact that he's treated the prosecution so poorly, I think it would be a shame if he actually ended up closing his courtroom to the public. And the defendant has a right to have a public trial in addition under the Sixth Amendment. Yeah, right on both accounts for sure. And Jeanette, Judge Schrader discussed other issues for which he felt he was criticized, right? Yeah, and one of those uh, was something that happened on the first day of jury selection when the he allowed Kyle Rittenhouse to reach into that tumbler and pull the numbers out uh, to select the alternate jurors. He said that's something he started about 20 years ago after he had a case with a black defendant in Racine, which is near here, and he said that the clerk picked the alternates in that case and it excluded the one black juror from the panel. So he said he started doing that so that the defendant could reach in there and. There would be no question uh, about the fairness of that process. Yeah, it makes sense. I, I can see where he's getting at, where I, I think the, the word was best used was quirky, uh, the different things that he does in the court. Definitely different than I think what we've seen in, in Brooklyn, Julie. I know you both practice in New York City, and so maybe that's where the criticisms are coming from, but I'm not sure if closing off the court, as Terry said, would be the smartest response to this. Of course, uh, justice is best seen in the light, not in the dark. Thank you, everyone, for your input. Still ahead on Law & Crime Daily, our Kyle Rittenhouse coverage continues from Wisconsin. Angela Levy hears from both supporters and protesters outside the Kenosha County Courthouse. All that and more after the break. It was the video that shocked the nation. An unarmed black jogger, 25-year-old Ahmaud Aubrey, gunned down in broad daylight. The three men charged will now stand trial. For live gavel to gavel coverage of the trial, subscribe to Law & Crime on YouTube TV today. Welcome back to Law & Crime Daily. We continue our coverage from Wisconsin in the trial of Kyle Rittenhouse. Let's check back in with Anjanette Levy outside of the courthouse. Brian, supporters of Kyle Rittenhouse are here outside the courthouse, along with people who want to see him convicted. And one of those is the uncle of Jacob Blake. He is the man whose shooting by Kenosha police sparked that unrest in August of 2020, where Kyle Rittenhouse ended up shooting those three men. Justin Blake has been here at the courthouse every day during outside and I asked him about the jury's request to see all of those videos. They're asking to see the videos. My sister, if they focus on the videos, we're going to get a serious win here today. That means he's going to jail. Maybe not on our cars, but he's not going home today. They throw out all the uh, uh, speaking and all the grandeur of the, the lawyers and the rhetoric and they're focusing on those uh, videos, which is the put, proof in the pudding. Also here are those supporters of Kyle Rittenhouse. They feel he did nothing wrong and was justified in shooting those men. Kyle Rittenhouse is part of this community. 
he was running, he was walking around with cleaning off graffiti, um, helping people. He helped the guy with the uh, shoulder. He was a young, decent man. And hearing him in the courtroom, I was just so compelled to come and show support for him because I would be proud to have a child like that. And one of the Rittenhouse supporters actually showed up on do, day two of deliberations here at the courthouse with a megaphone and some type of long gun. The deputies approached him and told him he needed to keep that at least a thousand feet away from the courthouse. Brian. Thanks, Anjanette. Now to news out of California. Kobe Bryant's widow is ordered to turn over nearly five years of therapy records amidst an ongoing lawsuit she brought against Los Angeles County. Early this week, a judge ruled Vanessa Bryant must turn over her mental health records dating back to January 2017. All this comes months after a lawsuit filed by Bryant alleging she suffers severe emotional distress and mental anguish. After county workers leaked photos to the press of the helicopter crash that killed her husband and daughter. Kobe Bryant and 13-year-old Gianna were among the nine people who died in the crash in January 2020. In a recent deposition, Vanessa Bryant testified that she is traumatized from the incident, has trouble sleeping, and is depressed. A judge ruled Bryant has until November 29th to produce the mental health documents. The trial is set to begin on February 22nd, 2022. Switching coasts now to news out of Washington, as a self-described QAnon shaman is sentenced to 41 months in prison for his role in the January 6th insurrection at the U.S. Capitol. This marks the longest sentence handed down for the offenders. 33-year-old Jacob Chansley pled guilty to one count of unlawfully obstructing official proceedings in a federal court on Wednesday. Chansley acted as a key figure during the attack, where he infamously marched through the Capitol wearing a horned helmet while Congress confirmed President Joe Biden's presidential victory. The defense argued that Chansley suffers from significant mental health issues and cannot be held completely responsible for his actions. Ahead of the sentencing, Chansley was held in jail for 10 months. Coming up on Law & Crime Daily, the so-called Tiger King says he deserves a new trial after a murder-for-hire conviction. Plus, the death of Ahmaud Arbery. We take you inside the courtroom where defense attorney Kevin Goff makes his opening statement and defendant Travis McMichael takes a stand. All that and more after the break. Back to Law and Crime Daily, defendant Travis McMichael, who shot and killed 25-year-old Ahmaud Arbery, takes a stand in his own defense. McMichael and his father, Gregory McMichael, face several charges in the death of Ahmaud Arbery, along with neighbor William Roddy Bryan. All three defendants are charged with malice murder, felony murder, and aggravated assault. In February of 2020, Gregory and Travis McMichael tailed Aubrey in their pickup truck as he went for a jog. Travis McMichael eventually shot Aubrey, claiming self-defense. He says he believes Aubrey was breaking into homes in the neighborhood. Brian followed along in his own pickup truck and recorded the incident on video. On Wednesday, Travis McMichael took the stand detailing past break-ins in his family's neighborhood when he says he feared for his safety. Having that experience, like I just said, that, you know, with him drawing the, or acting like he's drawing the weapon and then running into the house and then seeing the video that he's walking, walking around so nonchalant in that, that house kind of, it startled me a little bit that having that just happen, just catching him creeping through that front yard and obviously trying to uh, avoid detection and then doing what he did there and then going into the house and then walking around in there like it's no big deal was was alarming. Alarming why? Because I wouldn't think anyone acting normal would do that and somebody that's that's willing to act like they're, they have a gun or, or act like that they will harm you to prevent you from asking them or doing anything there and then go in and just act on normal and nonchalant is, and never catching the guy knowing what he's doing is just, it just sets off the alarm for me. Ahead of this, the jury heard a motion from defense attorney Kevin Goff. The fact that Mr. Bryan aided and abetted a citizen arrest, if he did that, doesn't establish malice in this case. It doesn't establish an intent to aid and abet an intent for a shooting. You know, 
And, Your Honor, I would urge the court to ponder the larger implications of the legal ruling that the state is requesting here. There is no malice murder case as to Mr. Bryan. There is no authority for this case. Your Honor, the state wants to talk about but for. I want to talk about intervening factors. Let's bring back criminal defense attorney Julie Rendleman and co-host Terry Austin. Terry Goff saved his opening until the end of the prosecution's case. Do you think that was effective? Oh, I think it was an excellent strategy, no doubt about it. He waited until the prosecution ended their evidence, and that gave him a big advantage. He's able to do his opening and say, this is what the evidence showed, not this is what I think the evidence will show. So his opening is positioned right before the defense case, and that's another advantage. It gives the jury an opportunity to follow what he said and to remember exactly what he said. So I think even though Goff's motions, for instance, the motion to not allow black pastors in the courtroom, those are offensive, I think this strategy was a smart strategy, and I think it was effective, and I applaud him for it. Agreed, especially when you have the other two defense attorneys already giving opening statements. They kind of carried some of the load for him in the beginning, and now he gets to kind of clean up at the end. I think it did work well. I agree with you there, Terry. Uh, Julie, the direct of Travis McMichael. What do you think so far uh, the defense brought out that was helpful for their case, and what do you think the prosecution will question him on cross? He continues to talk about the word de-escalate, um, and it, it, everything he did was quite the opposite of de-escalate. Um, he, you know, he gave a situation in where he thought he was being carjacked, showed them the gun, and that's all he did, and they backed off. This is a scenario where he doesn't see the guy doing anything but running away, and he chases him down with a gun, gets out of his vehicle, and then holds the gun to him, and then that's when the, the fight ensues. And so if I'm the prosecutor, I'm going to dive on the fact that this is the opposite of de-escalation. This is escalation at its finest. And there's nothing he did in any way, shape, or form to de-escalate, in fact, and, and, and was the direct and only cause of everything that transpired. Yeah, it's interesting the use of the words, the use of the training that he's employing, but then when you actually see the actions play out, to your, to your point, Julie, it seems to be counterintuitive or counterproductive to what de-escalation is. It's gonna be interesting to see how that cross-examination plays out. When we come back, the Tiger King is back. Law and Crime Daily sits down with Joe Exotic's attorney who says his client deserves another trial. The latest on the so-called Tiger King after the break. Welcome back to Law & Crime Daily. On the heels of the Tiger King 2 premiere docuseries frontman Joe Exotic fights to overturn a murder-for-hire conviction. Exotic, whose legal name is Joseph Maldonado Passage, uh, rose to fame at the height of the COVID-19 pandemic when the smash hit Tiger King was released on Netflix. The series documented Joe Exotic's passion for tigers and his feud with Carol Baskins, an animal rights activist who he claims killed her husband, Don Lewis. Lewis went missing in 1997 and was declared legally dead in 2002. In 2019, Joe Exotic was convicted on 17 counts of animal abuse relating to his care of exotic animals at the GW Zoo in Oklahoma. He was also convicted on two counts of attempted murder for hire, stemming from a plot to kill Baskin. Right now, Joe Exotic is being held in the Fort Worth Medical Center Federal Prison as he is treated for prostate cancer. Law & Crime Daily spoke with his attorney, who says their team is working toward an overturned conviction and a new trial, based on government misconduct and new evidence in the case. On the murder for hire, people need to realize this wasn't federal agents looking back on a series of facts and saying, oh, this person spoke to this person and this person spoke to this person and they plotted a murder. No. The government was there long before this happened and hired witnesses, uh, confidential informants, to essentially get words out of Joe's mouth. And how that went down in the cross conversations weren't part of the first trial, what the federal agent essentially was saying to these people to, to say, look, this is what the jury needs to hear for Joe to be convicted. That's, that's kind of what I learned to be textbook entrapment. Anybody that's followed this knows that Joe's still in prison. And Carol's still not in prison. 
And there's, there's still stuff going on with Doc Angel and Jeff Lowe in the legal spheres. And so we don't have a resolution yet, just if you look around. That's the difference between Tiger King 1 and Tiger King 2. Julie, do you see any grounds to overturn the Tiger King's conviction here? So we already saw that the appellate division had found an issue with regards to sentencing, but they didn't find an issue with regards to the conviction. Um, and so they've raised several points already, and it hasn't worked. If there's new evidence um, that establishes something more than just simply saying, oh, he was entrapped, because keep in mind, we have the actual audios. We know the conversations between these individuals. And so a jury could have determined what, in any, what if anything, rose to entrapment. The appellate division could have as well. There was no finding of that. So could something happen? Could something new come out? Of course. I just don't see it at this stage. All right, let's kind of follow that track as well, Terry. Could more eyes on this case, similar to the Free Britney movement, push this case towards being reexamined and possibly overturned? I definitely think that the more eyes on the case, the better it will be for Joe Exotic. The point is, people think they have a lot of sympathy for him because he's gotten this 22-year conviction. He just said some things. It wasn't serious. No one ended up getting killed. He was entrapped. And he didn't technically abuse animals, at least that's what they're saying. So I think community response will help. All right, let's see how this plays out. Thank you for joining us here on Law and Crime Daily. We'll see you next time as we discuss justice in America.